Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Cutoffs and coffee. We're your hosts here, as always, James and CT from T3 Performance. Today, episode 38 of the show, we have Joel Smith. He is the founder of Just Fly Sports and the host of the Just Fly Performance Podcast. If you are in the strength and conditioning industry at all, we are sure you've heard about Joel and some of his work. Today, we take a deep dive into intuitive training. We spend most of the conversation talking about how coaches can improve their own training individually and their training for their athletes and their teams by using and strengthening their intuition muscle. It's an awesome conversation. I promise you're going to take a ton of ton of notes from this one. And you're also going to have a ton of info that you're going to be able to implement today in your training session, not only yours as an individual, but your training session with your athletes. And today's episode is brought to you by, as you see CT wearing, the Cutoffs and Coffee crew neck. Now we talk about intuitive training. This is intuitive clothing, right? So if you're feeling a little cold, you put the crew neck on. And then the next thing you know, it's Cleveland, it's 65 and sunny. All you need to do is take that crew neck off and you have on a cut off some coffee tank top right here. So get all your cut off some coffee gear, hit up CT in the DMs, leave some comments in the show notes. All of the above. Um, if you like what we're doing here on the cut off some coffee podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, leave comments. Subscribe to us on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. Follow us on our individual social medias where we always give our listeners an opportunity to ask questions to the people we have on. Also, let us know who you want to have on. Um, Joel Smith became highly recommended to us, so we were able to get in touch with him and have him on the podcast. Um, one more quick point about this conversation is Joel had mentioned off air that he meant to mention it in the conversation, and this will make so much more sense when we get into it. But Joel programs a lot. The um, idea of let's say bear explore or crawl explore maybe throw explore and what he's trying to say here is he wants his athletes for a certain amount of time let's say five to ten minutes to explore these positions and crawling in the bear position um, with different type of medicine ball throws and he really believes that doing things like this as an athlete is going to be able to give you the opportunity to continue to push the needle forward in your performance just by exploring the human body and human movement. All right. So without further ado, here it is. Episode 38 cutoffs and coffee podcast with Joel Smith. Enjoy. Coach Joel Smith. Welcome to the show, man. We're, we are so excited to have you on today. Colin James. Thanks for having me. I really, it's great to be here. You know, first thing you, we talked about when you popped on was we did recognize that you had Yes, an espresso in your hand, but no cutoff. Actually, the quite quite the opposite. We have a hooded zip up hoodie, and um, I think there's something really interesting about that story that you might need to share with our audience and and your audience who's listening about um, you know your lack of your lack of cutoff. Oh yeah, I don't even own one. Sorry, I I I think that's some sort of cardinal sin if you even call yourself a strength coach or trainer or anything in that anything that involves the gym. I. I don't know, man. Yeah, I used to have a bunch when I was in college. I'll tell you that. I actually, I went to, I went to Cedarville and got in trouble once because uh, you weren't allowed to go around with your shirt off there, which is hilarious. Um, and then I, so and to mitigate that, I took a shirt and just shredded it basically. So it was like this strand of a cutoff shirt, and some, some RD or RA was giving me uh, trouble for it in the cafeteria. I used to have a lot. Sorry, I don't want to get too carried away. I used to have a lot of them. <laughs> I don't know why I don't have any more. I at least need one. So you guys have reminded me of that fact. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. We'll, we'll send you a cutoff, so call, cut off and then we'll make it a custom cutoff. So we'll, we'll make sure to get that cut for you before we send it out. Um, you know, that's a great answer to something that we need to know about you that we can't find from a Google search, but why don't you give us something else? You have so much awesome information. You've been doing it for such a long time. If you just search on YouTube or you search on Google or Instagram, Joel Smith or just fly sports, you're going to find a ton of info. Is there something you think we need to know about you that we cannot find from a quick Google search? Yeah, I mean, I think that what you you would find the people that I worked with more, like oh, I worked with this person and this person. But ultimately, I I just feel like so much in this whole thing is the journey that you go on as an individual. So, what I think you wouldn't learn about me is my own individual journey, like some of the mentors behind the scenes that I've learned from, uh, which I think we'll get to today. And then a lot of it just comes back to, for me, like you. You wouldn't know how I train every day and incorporate basically everything that I learned on my podcast. I've learned from mentors 
and um, I, I basically just like how I play and explore with movement and training on a regular basis. So those are, I, I think, um, yeah, I suppose that's not really a fact. It's just something you wouldn't learn. You know, on the outside, you'd know who I work with, what I write about training exercises, um, you know, the person. I, I'm excited to share a little bit more with you guys today and kind of my process there. Yeah, awesome. And um, you you had already mentioned just just there, like you're always trying new skills. You're always challenging yourself. Again, if you just go to your Instagram page, there's something that seems to be every day. You're you're trying something new. You're you're doing things on the heel. You're doing things on the toe pad. You're doing things on one leg. You're jumping and you're throwing. What is the most recent skill, if you can think of it, uh, that you've tried to teach yourself? Oh yeah, totally. And maybe this would be the thing that you wouldn't truly like the, the fact or the thing is I used to be really into break dancing. I mean, if you listen to my podcast, I mentioned it, but I used to be really into break dancing in high school. Um, and so back when I was back when I was doing that, like, I, I don't know, it's funny, because I, I grew up in a, in a family that did not dance, like, and I said, I went to Cedarville, too. If everyone's familiar with Cedarville University, <laughs> there was no dancing rules there and things. And it's like, I just, I've always, I was a basketball player. I've always had this love for rhythm, you know, as soon as like kind of rap and hip hop music. And I was exposed to that. Like that's always been something that's really been near and dear to me. I just resonate with a lot of that type of thing. And so I think that just rhythm and, and beats and movement and moving uh, and the break dance, like kind of the explosiveness and athleticism of it, that all hit together. And I started getting into that in high school. And funny enough, like you know, we, some people talk about spinal engine, like, okay, what is it? I mean, I don't think you have to even know that much about it. If you watch break dancing, watch a video, that's a, you can't do that well without a good spinal engine. <laughs> there is minutia, but the, the twisting and the explosiveness of that. And it was funny when I was in high school, I, um, I'm six foot, about six foot one. And I, I touched, um, my senior year touched three inches above the top of that square, 11, seven. And some of the main training, and this is, we'll get into the intuition here too. And I love this convert, these types of conversation is my training was playing basketball, going home and break dancing. And then I, I watched a high jump video, a training video. And I was doing, um, I had a cinder block in the basement, like an eight inch cinder block, 10 inch cinder block. I might've stacked something on it. I was doing one set of 10 step ups every few days with like a bar on my back that I had to finagle on my back. That was part of that journey too. And granted, I've done tons of other training for a long time before that but like for that you know two month window that led up to this just like amazing display that was my quote unquote training and I still try to um I just see a lot of times in strength and conditioning there's a lot of times it's just well let's just do the same list let's go do the powerlifting program the bench press program the squat program there's nothing wrong with that I am wired and I feel like it just as human beings we're wired to play to explore to try to master new skills. And so I'm actually trying to, I've been really bringing it back to trying to do some of the moves that I could do. I'm at 38 and I want to be able to do a lot of the moves I could do at 18 and, and figure out why I couldn't do some of them and then improve on some of the skills that I was doing. So it's like this. And I think we also just grow as an organism by having skills to be better at. So if I learn a new breakdance move, I get this hit of dopamine, this accomplishment, that makes me stronger. That makes me better at whatever else I'm doing. And we forget that. We forget to play and realize that play can feed. If you want to get stronger, your body likes mastering skills, like in the warm up or whatever else. So anyways, trying to hit some breakdance moves that I, I haven't hit in a while. It's been the big one recently. Are athletes doing that now? Breakdancing? I mean, not just breakdancing, but like exploring, right? Because I, th I think about a two similar story. I know on, I've heard you talk about, you know, doing like air alert and, and different jump programs like that. And I, you know, I, I would do things like that. I remember being in the basement when we were remodeling it, trying to jump around and my parents would yell at me because it's shaking the upstairs and, you know, and then you, I bought a heavy bag and I would box for a while, but it's like, are, are kids doing that? Or it seems to me that they want to find the perfect program. They, they want to run that program. They, you know, they, they want everything to be structured and they expect a certain outcome from it. And when they don't get this outcome, they don't know where to go from there. Yeah. But dude. I think if they would look at it the way that you've explained it, we'd be able to have a lot more, a lot more long-term success. Yeah. And that's it. And that's the, I, I love that you said that. Um, like that is, is everything that I've been thinking about the last really two or three years before I left. Um, I'm in Ohio now. I lived in Berkeley, California for eight years. And one of the last conversations I remember having with 
um, and uh, just someone I randomly met at the playground basically there before I left was a, a teacher. Um, actually, no, I went camping uh, with, a, with a group. It was a group camping with a bunch of kids running around and I was talking with two teachers in Berkeley and very progressive minded individuals. And we, you know, in the midst of a few drinks, me and this other individual were like, oh, we should come up with this book called Unstructured because the teacher as well was sick of the fact that in this society we live in, it's not a society of, of like less or minimalism. It's a society of more. How much more can I put on your plate? It, things are always added to people's plates, not taken away. And sadly, I think we're at the mercy of, you know, the, an academic system that it is has to be the way it is. And then sports are piled on top of each other. The gym is piled on top of sports. It's just, it's a world of more. And it's also a world of, of just more structure. And then the way that we market things, it's you, you beat the other person in marketing by offering something that gets them the results faster. It's like, if I can get the same result in a vertical jump program, which, I mean, that's just totally up in there, but let's just say all vertical jump programs give you six inches on your jump in, I don't know, three week, three months, which probably wouldn't happen for a trained athlete. But for someone who's never trained, sure, I can beat the other person by saying, well, I'll get it to you in six weeks. I'll do it in four weeks. I'm going to double in. And it's that insane runaway mentality. That's not just jumping, that's sprinting, that's, it could be an agility or how fast is my pitch and all these things. And, and we have replaced the natural process. Think of a plant growing in nature. Just think of a tree. Think of the steadiness and patience of nature. And we've replaced that with this hyper get results faster, get, get results faster. And the thing is, is guess what? If I have a young athlete, yeah, I can do some of those programs and I can really intensify and I can get them results quicker than the next kid. But where are they going to go the next year? They're not going to be able to repeat that. In fact, you go through a few cycles of that process in a row, that hyper 12-week program in a row, and eventually you're just going to get burned out. I mean, we all know that you can't pile too many intensified training blocks on each other before something gives, before the system resets itself. The athlete has a crash in performance. We have to rebuild from the beginning and get it back. So I think that we've, we've overstructured. We have too much. And it's on the, we have the marketing end where it's like, I'm going to get you this result. I'm going to save you time doing it. And saving time is good. I mean, there's a lot of inventions that save us time and that's great. But when it comes to nature and the human body, I don't think that that's as good of an idea and it's not sustainable. That's the big thing. It's, it's, you can get that athlete that results, but they will not be able to sustain them as well. And then the last thing I'll just put in is I've seen being able to work with Olympic level and Olympic caliber athletes, you see, look, this isn't about the next year. This is about the next quad, the next four years and the four years after that. And coaches thinking quads. And you also see like athletes who being through track and swimming, I've seen athletes who come from these very intense coaching regimes where those coaches get results, really high intensity training. I have you for one year, two years, four years. I'm going to get you results. Um, and Larry Judge was the king of this. If that name rings a bell, he was a throws coach at South Carolina. I had a conversation with Bert Soren. Um, He's the president of Sorenex or uh, the, the, the owner. And he was saying he went and threw for Larry Judge in South Carolina. And this would be like an example. And they had girls there push pressing 300 pounds and they dominated in NCAAs. These guys and girls were just torching people. But guess what those kids did after college? <laughs> Nothing. Like it was all used up. And so that can be extrapolated back to however far you want to go. And so I've been rambling forever, sorry. Uh, but I, it's just, this, you, you struck a button and just blah, they just came out. So I'll, I'll let you guys follow up with that. No, I mean, that's, well, that's no. why we have you here is, is to talk that's about- That's exactly what I was gonna say. So we, we appreciate that. And even with the kind of in that same tone, like you still have the ADD athlete who might like run a 12 week program that worked pretty well and then turn to the coach and say, all right, what do I do now? I need something new. Whereas like in all reality, they could probably do the same thing again and be fine. Uh, but they also have this like ADD. So like when we use that intuitive training, we're kind of tapping into that ADD where we let them choose a little bit. So it's like them starting to steer the ship with some bumpers, like the coaches are the bumpers. Um, and we're helping them kind of work their way down um, that path of athletic development. But um, you know, before we get too far into the podcast, I, I'd love our listeners to hear a little bit about your background. If you want to take us from the break dancing days of, of Joel to, <laughs> to kind of where you're at now. Yeah, it's funny because it started with break dancing, and here I am, 38 break dancing again. <laughs> it all comes full circle. Yeah, I 
Yeah, the quick version is, yeah, I grew up as a kid who just was in love with training. Like, I remember even, this is fun. When I was five, we'd play, I'd be playing tag with my, you know, friends in the neighborhood or my brother. And I remember watching Speedy Gonzalez on, as a cartoon back in the 80s or early 90s and saying, like, Ariba to run faster. Like, I was so obsessed in wall sets at age 10, like, just crazy with the stuff. But what's well, funny now, because I'm getting into Nick Winkleman's work, you know, analogies and imagery. And I'm like, oh, I had it right when I was five, you know, trying to you know use something meaningful to help myself run faster um but yeah i did soccer and basketball and baseball and, and eventually settled on track because i think i was i just didn't i know why i wasn't as good at those other sports now i just didn't have the the sport exposure early enough in a way that allowed me to be good at that i was better at training i was better at the lifting and the plyometrics and figuring out how to jump higher which didn't make me it made me an okay basketball player but not an amazing one and so that's another thing I look at a lot. And that, that journey kind of really feeds into, well, how do I develop the total athlete? We're not just, because we all know the guy who's super strong or girl is super strong and can run fast, but doesn't get to play, uh, especially once we get on the higher levels. So uh, got a college track scholarship, did the jumps, high jump, triple jump, uh, through javelin, ran hurdles and stuff in college and coached at Wilmington College for four years in Ohio. Um, somehow found my way into division one strength coaching. I actually, I, to, to go back just quickly, I actually, I didn't want to be a strength coach when I was in my early twenties. I did some internships. They were not very exciting. They were very simplistic, very structured, more about yelling at the athlete and giving a couple cues. There was no problem solving. That was not exciting to me. And so I said, I want to coach track. There's, I feel like there's more problems here. If that makes sense, there's more nuances and things I can do. And it's all performance. It's all speed. It's all jumping. And in some ways, I think that a lot of strength coaches would love to be track coaches because guess what? You know, the thing that you're trying to get better at, that is the win and the win or the loss, right? That's the outcome. And how often does I think in strength and conditioning, we can make these physical improvements, but we might see it not fully come to fruition. We could see some, it's always fun to evolve and improve. But anyways, um, started uh, my website, Just Fly Sports when I was 27, although I'd been writing for a while and that helped me. Uh, to get a job at UC Berkeley as a strength coach. So it's like, all right, now I'm back in strength and conditioning. This thing I kind of wanted, was not really into, but now I am. I was always into it. I mean, I was the strength coach at Wilmington too, but not like the full-time strength coach doing only that. Strength coach for eight years. I worked with track, tennis, water polo, and swimming. Swimming, um, before I was a track guy, really swimming transformed me as a coach, just in general, seeing how swimmers learn, uh, what being around elite Olympic athletes. I learned from them more than they learn from me. I mean, just being able to observe what makes those athletes unique and special. I uh, learned a ton from their coaches, the motor learning and swimming, and just the process of mentally um, and intentionally taking athletes through workouts. Uh, I left Cal in 2020 in the middle of COVID, moved back to the Midwest here in Ohio, uh, just more affordable. I was already, a lot of what I was doing was online. So I uh, just moved to a more affordable po uh, place in the country. And here I am. I'm in the private sector now. I do a ton of stuff online, have a podcast, um, some you know, courses and things like that and books. And uh, I also I do coach in person a few times a week right now in the private sector. And, and I also coach my five-year-old uh, soccer team. So I'm getting into youth sports as well. I'm trying to like experience all the all this and ends and corners of this industry. Well, Ohio's uh, happy to have you back. Uh, you know, as, as you know, we're from Avon. So um, you know, definitely nice to know that you're only a couple hours away from us um, and, and, you know, that the athletes in your area are getting the benefit from being able to go see you firsthand. Um, you, you have a, a, you know, a wide variety of experience. And I think it's so cool to see a strength coach who started as a, as a coach because you're, you're at first like starting to coach skills and, and you're starting to see like how do the performance training, how does that actually relate to like our sport? And, and not only that, but you've also worked with athletes and field sports as well as like track, which like you said, that is what strength and conditioning is supposed to like tell us if we're doing a good job or not in, in that sport specifically. Um, you know, in, in your career, have you had any major paradigm shifting moments that kind of either made you look at like how we coach sports skills differently or how we coach uh, performance differently that's kind of shifted how you approach uh, what you do now? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think that I, I think I've always had a gift with intuitive coaching in the sense of my track and field uh, days at Wilmington. And I, I did coach for a couple of years at Wisconsin lacrosse in my grad school days before that. And 
I, I, when Dan Cleather, uh, who's uh, he's actually, I think he lives in Czechoslovakia, works uh, at St. Mary's in the UK, but we had this discussion on our podcast that as a coach, the more things that you've had to learn throughout your life, the more sports, the more skills that you've personally learned, that helps your intuition to communicate that process of learning better with athletes. And I do remember, I, I always just felt like just giving the internal cues just didn't work. Like you would tell an athlete something and then they actually go compete and they don't do it. And so instantly I'm like, okay, well that didn't work. <laughs> and so I've always been into trying to find like better ways uh, to coach, to communicate at the, that process. The big thing in moving to strength and conditioning, because that's where I had to really learn and redefine everything. Because when I started strength and conditioning at Cal, to me, that was not that was actually boring, to be honest. I went into that job thinking, well, I'll do this for a couple of years and hopefully it'll get me up to the D1 level as a track coach. That was a big thing that I had in mind um, for the most part. And not 100%, but I, it was actually taking on swimming there that really like, all right, this is a new challenge. This is something new and engaging and I can really roll with this. So my strength, I'll, I'll really look at tell you it in terms of my strength and conditioning sessions and how those change because that's changed everything and like tennis for example tennis players if you know them are not like really excited about lifting a lot of times they want to play they want to compete they want to have fun a lot of tennis players you know as opposed to maybe say football or rugby or you know a sport or baseball uh those athletes aren't that into it and so i remember i'm going to cal i'm, I'm you know, I'm trying to be this like kind of a hard ass and like, you know, keeping athletes on the button. Like this is what a strength coach is supposed to do. And those athletes just had the sourest faces. They did no one was having fun. Like, and I was like, I'm doing a good job because they might not be having fun, but they're getting stronger and this is what they're supposed to do. And da, 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 da. And so anyways, after a couple of years of that, <laughs> I, I, I started to, I, one just big game changer was going out and watching those tennis players play all these athletes who were like not excited about the gym and kind of screwing off a lot or trying to screw off and toe that line of what they could get away with you watch them play and they are emotional everything just is lit up they're complete all completely different people they're being insanely explosive changing directions sliding yelling you know hitting and putting emotion and force into it and if they were to throw a medicine ball with that same force I'd be like whoa these guys are explosive you know like it's so it's just it's just environment and how how are they perceiving this environment and what is the goal of this so that kind of led me on this path where i've had a really great mentorship and uh, paul cater is one who's been on my show uh paul it, he's an interesting cat he i met him in barcelona when i was 21 uh i was on a trip to spain at the olympic training center and he was there and then we reconnected in california and this guy just sees the world of training differently. Um, and it's only something you can completely understand by training with him. But the first time I trained with him, I went to a drive down to his gym. He doesn't write down, he really doesn't write down a lot of the work. He'll write down like the main squat set or the main Olympic set. And that's pretty much it. Everything before that, he just goes off the cuff. And, and he involves, he brings in music and competing and just having fun. And I remember one of the first like warm ups I did with him. I would literally jump like five or six inches higher after I was done with that. Everything was so loaded and engaged. I was like, this is what I feel like after playing basketball. This is amazing. And, and I was, and cause I mean, so much of, I think that we measure how good we did so oftentimes by, well, did I line up the athletes and make them do what they need to do? Did they clap on the whistle or clap on the beat or whatever? But it, it's, to me, it's like, if it's more like sport in so many ways, it's more effective are you do you get to play um do you get to have fun do you get to collaborate with a teammate do you get to not have to solve the movement problem the way your coach said can you figure out a solution yourself is there rhythm involved something external that's like you know maybe i can solve the problem to a beat and not just the coach saying do this you know like so there's so him working with him completely changed the way i saw warm-ups really the training session um, I, I'm so blessed that I was there close enough with him. And so uh, I started to really integrate that into tennis first. That was my first sport. I'm like, this is the sport with the longest faces. Swimming will do anything. The swimmers at Cal, literally, they'll do anything. Like, they want to be good so bad. They'll, you could do a workout that's not fun, and they'll still do it. If they, you could tell them this is going to make you better, they'll do it. They would not, they don't care. 
<laughs> so those are the types, the swimmers were the, the ones who made any, any coach with any program look great because they will do whatever it takes, but the tennis was not. And so to, for me, I had to like start change things. I got into the intuitive warmups where I didn't structure the warmups. I started to just make it up off the cuff. I started to integrate games. Um, a lot of Rafe Kelly stuff, like rough housing variations, chase variations, and all these things that make that, that made the warmup come alive. And then when we did get to the training, the lifting, it's all training, but the lifting, I guess it was so much, I mean, we barely needed to warm up and they already could get under it heavy weight if they wanted to and start getting after it with that, if that's your goal. And so just seeing how that could impact everything else was the biggest shift by far. There was some, uh, some swimming, some motor learning shifts as well that were really cool. But I think as per what we're talking about, I'll stick with kind of the tennis shift. Uh, and that was, that was just really massive for me as a strength coach and seeing why why do we even go in the gym sometimes? Because I think as a Kurt Hester said it well on my podcast, your athletes aren't you. Like I like to train. I like to lift weights. I like to push myself in these singular, more simple physical abilities. That doesn't actually represent the average person. And they're not wrong for that either. I think we tend to say, what's wrong with you? You don't want to lift a heavy weight. Like what's your problem? <laughs> you know, it's, it's movement is so much more than that. We can't put athletes in that box. It, it's it's so often that we see strength coaches wanting to do and give their athletes what they think they want if they were just in their shoes. Um, and, and we kind of also have to deal with, sometimes we have a, a coach, a sport coach coming into our weight room. And we also think we have to give that sport coach what we think that sport yeah. coach wants, which not always is them or a parent if we're training their kid walking into the gym and seeing their kids play spike ball to warm up or walking into CT's weight room at Notre Dame and seeing kids do uh, a bunch of long duration ISO holds and laughing and having a good time. Um, you know, ha have there been situations while you were kind of diving into this, let's just experiment a little bit with this tennis team that you had any interesting conversations with those coaches to try and explain what you were trying to do? Yeah, that's a really good question because I totally agree with you. I've had coaches where like if we play games for the first, I mean, tennis, I would play games for the first 30 minutes, sometimes 40 of an hour session, right? Like that's crazy. If you were a coach, you're like, wait, are we supposed to lift the whole hour? Like, you know, and that was the extreme end of it um, because I feel like those for those athletes playing basketball for 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and then lifting for 15 was the best. That was the best mix. Um, for others and other coaches expected, I could have never got away with that. And it took me years of getting the trust of the tennis coaches to do that. Water polo was an example of that. Those coaches would have never, they did not want to see that. They want to see water polo is a hard sport. We got to be tough. We're doing circuits and blah, blah, blah. And so I would try, I, my warmups for them were a lot less interesting. And I think I, I did actually try more of the games and roughhousing with water polo, but those athletes are such ruffians they actually were hurting themselves a little bit doing those. So, you know, that, that was, that was a tough one. That was my least playful warm up group, I would say. Um, swimming, swimming did grow over time when, it, and this was the thing too, is I, so like, I would say that the, the, the coaches, the, between the men's and the women's program were a little bit different. I think I was probably expected on the men's side a little bit more to be probably, I mean, I, we could have fun and play games, but if I would play games for 15 minutes with them, I think, or 20, that I may have, that may have wanted to be dialed back a little bit. Whereas the women's, I think I could do a little bit more and that was fine. Um, maybe that was just my perception, but there was one time I remember um, the men's team at Cal was at the Olympic training center. And that was just, I mean, that was their training trip and it was like intense and, and, and everything was on point. They're trying to get ready for their Pac 12s and nationals. And I just remember thinking one day, uh, you know, we, I was supposed to do like a dry land, like a, like a basic, uh, a dry land and swimming is like, uh, not weight. So just body weight, we're on mats and we're doing different movements on mats, which is not very exciting. <laughs> you know, and I would try to put a lot of crawls. Like we were in a wrestling room a lot. So we do crawls and all these things and wheelbarrow walks. And you know, it's a lot more fun than doing abs and more interesting and more motivating. But these athletes have been training so hard and the coaches were not there for this one. And I, I took the liberty. I don't think they would have liked this. Um, but in hindsight, it was a good time. So I was in the, I was just getting this sense, like everyone walked in kind of long faced. I mean, you all know it as a coach, like when athletes are just kind of like, we've been training hard. If I go and do this intense 
ab workout, we're just not going to get a lot out of it. Yeah, you did some abs, but how much, how did that help you adapt to be, to handle everything else you have to do? Uh, and I view fun, fun is kind of like the ultimate break to like very structured, intense training. When you have the constraint of a lower nervous system output and fatigue, that constraint says, hey, let me do a better job with the unstructured and having fun to replenish my reserves so I can go back into that structure training. So anyways, I was in the locker room before this dry land that I'm feeling to myself, I don't want to really work these athletes very hard. They need a rest. They need a break. They need something fun. And there was these wrestlers. This was at the Olympic training center. There's these wrestlers in there. They're like, I mean, like eight packs, like jacked. Like, and I'm like, hey, um, guys, do you guys know any like wrestling games? Like, what are some like game? What's a rest, a fun like wrestling game that no one's gonna get hurt doing? And they're like, oh yeah, like the knee, like you 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 go and you try to touch the other person's knee and and don't let them dive, because <laughs> if they dive, they could hurt a shoulder. So I organized instead of doing that dry line, I organized this massive tournament based off class. All right, freshmen over here, sophomores over here, juniors, seniors, uh, post grads over here. They didn't, the, po the Olympians didn't try super hard because they didn't, you know, for them, if, if they hurt it, separate a shoulder playing this game, that's really stupid for them. But a lot of the other athletes, we had a big giant tournament and who could win. And those, there was yelling and screaming and laughing. And to me, that was like one of the best things that you could do in the midst of all this other hard training is just, I, I don't even care what the adaptation is here. My adaptation is fun right now. And so that was actually an area where I almost had to sneak it in because the coaches left. <laughs> But I have videos from that time. It's something I'll always remember. I think the athletes will always remember that kind of thing. So, yeah, it, you have to roll with the coach generally, though, with what they, they want and expect to a level. But as you gain trust and as you communicate, you know, you can, you can really fit in that fun and that, that total experience when it's really helpful for the athlete. What's so cool about something like that, and I apologize because this is somewhat of an assumption, but – I bet for the next couple of weeks or months or years, however long you worked, worked with those athletes, every time they came in and you started warming up and you started talking to them, I bet they said something along the lines of, oh, are we going to play the, or are we going to do the right insert, whatever you called the game, whatever the competition style was. And rarely have I had athletes come in with that level of, of excitement said, are we going to front squat today? <laughs> right? are we, do, we doing hand cleans at 80%. Yes. Yeah. And they're, they're so stoked about it, but you do recognize that about the game and it, and it seems like it makes much more of a lasting impact on the athletes. And it just gets them more excited to be, to be back in the weight room, a place that like you already mentioned that we love, but a lot of times these are athletes who don't really thrive in that situation. That's such a, I think, cool dynamic change to be able to introduce that to them. Yeah. Even in youth sports, like five-year-old soccer kids, uh, it, with the coaching clinic that I went for these young athletes, it's funny. I, so I had this coaches meeting and, excuse me, after the end of it, we had a, like a 40 minute clinic where all the, you know, five-year-old soccer coaches are going to learn some, and I'm thinking, I'm going to this clinic thinking, man, like I have to do five, you know, soccer drills for five-year-olds. Like what's this clinic going to be about? But then the guy comes out and you have very like European accent. I'm just thinking it's gonna be super serious. And all 40 minutes was on how to make it like a pirate story for these kids. Like here's the buried treasure and here's your soccer balls, the cannonball. And and, and, and he's like, look, the kids are gonna come and ask to play pirates. They're not gonna come and ask to play soccer. They, they're like, can we play that pirate game? Can we be this? Can we be that? And you know, obviously you're not, that's not gonna work with 18 year olds. Like, oh, we're gonna be pi or, you know, college kids. We're gonna be pirates. But it just reminds you that there's always a, a story that's more fun, you know, if that makes sense. And again, I mean, I'm not saying that I like, I mean, if you wanna talk about grind, like I've been there, like I've done the hard 400 meter track workouts, like I've done, me and my old boss at Cal did these brutal, like there was this cube method, like training system for powerlifting. And it was a, an app at the computer. And my boss just turned everything up to max. Like we, we did the powerlifting for 45 minutes and an hour 15 of auxiliaries. And I would take a 30 minute nap after. I mean, I, I am good at kicking my own butt. I've been there. like, and I, and I've also had experiences where kicking my own butt more didn't make me faster. My freshman year in college was hundred percent that I, I got three seconds slower in the 400 kicking my butt instead of playing basketball and having fun, like, and, and doing more speed work. Like I've been there where just because you work harder and train harder and grind does not mean that you end up being faster. And I've generally found the more meaning and, and, and it's not necessarily, I mean, it's not like a necessarily a free for all, like meaning can take on a lot of shades, but generally speaking, um, 
there just needs to be like more emphasis on creating meaning first. However you do that and however it fits in context of your session and however you communicate that with every um, person on that team that you're working with, you know, the, the sport coach, the strength coach. Um, I just think that that is just, it's just key. It's, it's telling, it's, we need to learn to tell stories. Uh, and then how does, how does the story change as you get older? What's meaningful for you as you get older? Um, that's the things you're going to remember too, like you guys said. So I just think that's a massive direction for things. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think we have, we have our warm ups. you know, as the biggest opportunity for us as a coach to help the athletes forget about everything else going on in their world. And, and then they can open up and listen to us and we can open up and listen to them and really find out like what's going on in, in, in this athlete's world and, and then have good conversations about, well, what do we need to accomplish now that we're warm, we're loose, we're smiling, we're having a good time. And we forget about that AP test. That's not until tomorrow, but I don't need to worry about it right now because I'm just going to have fun in the gym with my strength coach and my team. Um, you know, it, I kind of want to turn that into what I really want to talk about, which is our intuitive training, either as a coach or as an athlete. And, and, and how have you seen that concept evolve for you personally? Um, I've had some experience putting athletes on what I call the menu, and I'd walk them through it and say, hey, guys, we're going to Chipotle today. All right. And, and we need to choose. Do we want a burrito or a burrito bowl? All right, what's our main entree? Do you want to hit something for a, a juicy quad pump or do you want to get those ham sandwiches working? So, so then I kind of related it to my athletes in the sense of like, we're just ordering food from Chipotle and letting them kind of steer their own ship. And it was such a cool experience. It was awesome. And, and I truly believe they'll retain more from that little time we spent together and remember how to train themselves because I don't want to be their first strength coach. I don't want to be their last strength coach. Um, and I want them to pursue, you know, athletic endeavors, even when it's not in an organized fashion. I think little things like that help. I want to hear it from, from your experience, how you've incorporated some of these things and in, in kind of um, the nuances of this intuitive training. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something I'm definitely excited. That's another like almost like button there that gets me going. But yeah, I, I love, um, yeah, Corey Schlesinger was one of the, yeah, the first coaches I had heard back in the day who kind of, yeah, he, he used that menu system type idea. And he had uh, the first time I met Corey, he was at Stanford and had this cool like touch screen, like he had this touch screen rigged up so athletes could actually like select their menu, almost like you're ordering from like, uh, you know, McDonald's now, right? Like where you just go in. I haven't been to McDonald's in a while, but I know it's more touch screens now. <laughs> I was like, thinking the same thing I'd imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I did go once last year and I, I went once or twice a year in Hawaii because that's where the women's swim coach would have us go in. So anyways, or, or Panera, whatever. It's a lot of it's like that now. But um, anyways, so yeah, he had this, it was all menus. And I was like, wow, like this, before that, a big thing I had heard with the menus was like the first, I never gave my athletes menus when I was at Wilmington. It was always what I wrote. It was very me centric. I didn't think, I didn't think at the time, oh, I can let my athlete pick something here. And then my first year at Cal, uh, Matt Chisholm, he, he doesn't coach track anymore, but he was the track coach for multi events at the time there and was telling me about in the peaking or the taper uh coaches who he knew would like they would say just give athletes menus towards the final week and say hey you can do what you want today and i was like blown away really you're gonna let them pick like shouldn't we like super structure this and you know his rationale is you know that you've put in the work already at this point it's more about the athlete feeling like they're doing the right thing than anything and so I just think the menu system is is massive so between that and Corey and then like thinking about that more the menus have definitely been in my training. I would say my menus, um, the way I tend to work it, I'm by nature, I am a little more ADHD. I am a little less structured. Um, all coaches are different. You're going to get, and I, I think a lot of the coaches who are really into the games, fully exploring the games, I think they're a little bit like me. They have some ADHD-ness to them. They like to be all over the place. And that's a game. It's chaos, right? And you're making up rules on the fly and there's some and then on the other side, like if you look at like the Myers-Briggs typology, right? You have 16 different personality types. Each coach, it, we each have our own strengths and the, the, the place we are more comfortable. I am more comfortable in the chaos. I'm more comfortable in let's just go for the, for, for the warm up, And then we're going to, I'm going to read it and figure it out and, and base my, my uh, judges, the smile on the athlete's face. And I'll come up with ideas and we'll roll with it that way. 
the more structured end is the more like, all right, here's your menu systems, here's your menu systems. And, and, and all is good. I would say I use menu systems. I'm probably a little more biased towards um, just the, doing a longer warmup and letting athletes roll with that. Um, my menus have always historically been more on like the weights. I never have the, you know, it never says you have to do this weight. I would always say, here's your range, stay, you know, within 20 pounds of this. That, that was always more of the choice that I ended up giving athletes, I think, and just kind of trying to explain that to them. I think that, I, I think that's actually probably a little bit something I'm doing more though of. That's like where my strength is the chaos and my weakness is the regimented stuff. That's where I'm actually working on filling out my programs more is that. Um, one of the, the most elegant ways I felt like I've seen in doing the menu systems was the women's swim coach at Cal, Terry McKeever. In the fall, the off season, the athletes got to pick the, the what. They didn't get to pick the volume, but they got to pick the what. So they got to pick their strokes. Here's the workout. You pick the stroke you want to do for the, this, this, this. The athletes get choice. They feel seen and they can do that, that stroke. In the in season, that now it's the strokes are fixed. You're going to be doing these at the meet, but now it's the volumes. It's this. You can pick volume, intensity A, volume, intensity B, and those kind of things. So the athlete is getting the choice. It's just the type of choice changes once the time and season changes. Um, so I really like that. Um, I'll say that with the intuitive warm up, that the way that I tend to do it in person more and, and in my online programs, especially in taper season, I do do, I do give menus. I try to make a regular occurrence of that. Um, how I've done the intuitive stuff. So for me, uh, yeah, my strength is definitely more running gun a little bit. So it started after spending time with Paul Cater and seeing how he and Paul again, kind of like me, I think he's got that open chaos type strength as a coach, would just literally just run and create for 40 minutes. And, and so I started with tennis, instead of going through the warmup, it turned into, oh, I would hand the captains the warmup, to, to, and they would take the team through it. And I'm giving them some ownership because the captains are taking the team through the warmup. And then it became, all right, I'm just going to figure out how to just do this warmup myself with no card. Like I'm going to take them through it and I'm just going to just kind of, you know, I know the, I know the work, I know we're going to do lunges and we're going to do crawls and whatever, but I, I'm going to try to do this without a card, without having to look at something. Cause that's life, right? You shouldn't have to sit there and look at the thing. Like if you're giving a speech, you shouldn't have to have the speech right in front of you. You should know what you're going to say and then just be able to do it and then be able to improvise a little bit and be able to flow a little bit. And so eventually it became, I just would totally improvise the warm up. And then as I learn more, as I learn more games, like things that I learned from Rafe Kelly, human level stuff, like human manipulating an object, uh, like medicine ball, improvising medicine ball throws. But that was a big thing Paul would do. He would come up with all sorts of fun, different challenges with medicine ball throws in the warm up. Light balls, they're like just a basketball, just take a basketball and just chuck it at the other person as fast as you can type stuff. You know, we, we're used to 10 pound med balls. Here's a basketball, just chest pass, fast as you can, overhead, fast as you can, like just manipulating velocity and all these different like elements that you haven't done before. And novelty is a massive attention sink too. And Nick Winkleman had talked about that. Just the fact that there's novelty in there, that will draw attention. And if athletes are doing the same movement prep over and over, that does not, that does not draw in attention by itself. You have to, there has to be something else in there. Uh, so, and eventually it became a lot of games. Uh, we might, someday we would just play basketball, but a lot of times I would just say, all right, here's some, here's some chase games I'm going to do. Here's some rough housing variations I'm going to do. <clears throat> here's some bear crawl type variations I'm going to do. And even bear crawls, you can be insanely creative. You can have people bear crawl and, and every, like, whenever you feel like it, say three push ups. they have to stop the crawl and do three push ups. keep going. Okay. Whenever you feel like, all right, five push ups, or right, they have to do five, you know? And honestly, if you want to get jacked, like that's so that's so random because we're in nature, like in natural currents, let's just say animals, they know they don't know how far they're going to have to run if they're getting chased or chasing something. And that's part of sport. That's taking the principles of sport and nature and chaos. And you're putting in some in something a little more fixed. And I find mentally that really helps athletes because so oftentimes um, the principle of easy strength uh, like is uh, for people who aren't familiar with aren't familiar with easy strength, Dan, John, and Pavel, one of the greatest books of all time in strength and conditioning, and it fits for all sports in my opinion, is what I've taken out of that book is the killer of gains 
is you judging yourself because you didn't hit the goal of what you expected. You expected to lift this much. You went in the weight room, you tried it, you didn't get it. Now you take a, a, um, a hormonal hit and you uh, judgment because you didn't get it versus if it, unless uh, as opposed to you're just experiencing this thing. I'm just experiencing it the same way. I mean, think about it. you're playing football or basketball. How often do you judge yourself for, you know, like not being explosive enough on something? No, it's all about, did you get the ball? Did you make the play or whatever? And so when we take it away from just numbers and put it into experience, how are they experiencing this throwing randomness, novelty, uh, now they're just doing all these movements and they're experiencing it. And I find that to be a lot more stable and consistent than making just everything about numbers. Did you hit this max today? Did you hit this percentage today? Because in nature, that doesn't happen. Like it never, it never happens in nature. It's all open chain and purpose driven. And I'm not saying numbers are wrong. I mean, you're never going to lift a certain amount unless you have some sort of like point in time where you have some sort of basic level or in sprinting, you're never going to be as fast as you can until you have a clock. And you're, you're, you have that time feedback that needs to be in there every now. And then I'm just saying it, it should be less of the total equation. And so, yeah, for like the crawls, there's so many infinite ways that you can do that. Or let's just say hops. Like it's very common to do, like you could say jump roping. Okay. We're jumping rope. Uh, there's the rudiment hop series that a lot of people might do like, okay, go and do these rudiment hops, you know, hit with a flat foot, whatever you're going to coach the contact to, but that's, it's boring. Like it's, it's boring. And you have to sit there and ask yourself what is being accomplished here relative to the athlete actually getting out and playing their sport where there's a lot of explosion, all these movements. So you can make hops more exciting. Every time you uh, clap, the athlete has to do a tuck jump. Like you're doing your rudiment hops, clap, do a tuck jump. You know what I'm saying? Like you can mix these things to drive attention and make it more meaningful and mix like more explosion or, or I'll do a mirror um, rudiment hop where you're hopping you have to hop like a rudiment kangaroo, but you follow the person in front of you and they get to do, they can twist, they can do 360s, they can zigzag and you have to try to do whatever they're doing. That is so much more interesting for athletes. Watch their faces. They are so much more engaged. They're so much more interested. I was actually just doing that warm up with a running group. I work with a, a, like they're actually mostly distance runners on the weekends. And a lot of what I do is that type of warm up because they're getting, what's the main chunk of their training? Kind of boring consistent running like which is great that's what they do but if now what i give them in the weight room is just boring consistent all hyper specific stuff for running i was just boring it's just boring i think that they need to be an athlete and so uh, we warmed up like that like that kind of as i was as i was describing like last saturday we did a lot of the mirror partner bouncing drills and one of the athletes literally his best standing vertical not that standing vertical is like massive for a distance runner but it, it does give you some indicator of at least elasticity this one kid jumped um, three inches higher than he did in the fall. I mean, it's just, yeah, in the fall. And like at least, yeah, I think he jumped three and a half inches higher. And, and, and he is so lit up after those warmups. Like if I tested it in a regular, he would jump three, four inches less. Easy. When we do that type of stuff, this kid is just like a bouncing machine. And so it's you, when you see that the, the fact that, no, this wasn't just fun, get the jump mat out oh, you jumped away higher than if we just did the normal warm up. That's it too. Like how, cause this, it doesn't, it's not just good for the sake of fun. It also is good for seeing that instant output. And it, the more we can blend all these concepts together, we see outputs too, because that's the thing that people wouldn't want to compromise. Well, I can't, can't, can't compromise fun because, oh, what if the output goes down? Well, it doesn't, it gets better. <laughs> it actually improves. And that's the beautiful thing when you do it well. Joel, where can we start? You mentioned a little bit. That was awesome, by the way. You mentioned a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take my athletes through this warm up, and, and the only thing I'm gonna do is is remove this sheet of paper, so I don't have a crutch, right? Burn the boats, right? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna figure it out either way, right? And then kind of get into this this structured training. Where do we start, coaches who don't have this approach who want to take intuitive training to the next level where where can we start them to slowly work their way in to get them comfortable with doing a little bit at a time to then eventually grow to where they're doing more and like you'd mentioned 30 45 minutes of it um wh where's the starting point there yeah that's you know that's an awesome question because that is i mean that is just it like i, I think a lot of coaches who are like so creative and so intuitive a drawback of people like you know, who, who really run and go with the chaos of people like myself in that situation is sometimes it's hard for that person to slow down and structure things to say, Hey, here's the entry. Here's level one. And okay, here's where you go. 
So number one is number one, do all the warm ups yourself, just making it up as you go at some point. Like you have to do it yourself first. You're like, all right, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to do some crawls. I know I'm going to do some lunges. I know I'm going to do some hops. I know I'm, there's some monkey bars. I know I'm going to do some monkey bars. Here's a medicine ball. And maybe just start, just start by go, yourself going through like stage, maybe make stations, go ahead and find a gym and make five stations. Here's crawl, here's climb, here's throw, uh, wh whatever. And just give yourself a minute at each station and just start, start going yourself. You do it yourself. And then if, if you feel an improvisation you can make, go do it. Hey, I'm, I'm doing medicine balls. You know, it'd be fun to try it like this. I'm going to try it like that. And so you as a coach need to be there first. And I feel like it's kind of like, this is something on some level, I feel like we've lost. Like in the martial arts, right? If you go to the dojo, the Shaolin master is the guy who's done all this stuff. Like, where did we kind of, it's like, we, we got to this point where it's like, wait, no, you go to college and you get taught all this stuff. And now you, you got a certification. Now you're like, you didn't have to do it. Like you need to do it. You need to go and be creative for a while. And I know that's a lot of people's not, I mean, again, I'm, I am that chaotic, open, open type personality in many ways. So I get it if it's not your strength. My strength, what's not my strength is going through data and tracking data over time. I, I was horrible at that at Cal. I've always, every year review, like, hey, Joel, you need to do more data. <laughs> like, it's like, look, like we, we jumped higher, like, cool. Like, I don't know. Anyways, um, so that is my weakness. If I, I would be a poor, I think I would be a relatively poor sports scientist. Like if I had to sit and really track data and, and hand it to the coach and talk to them about it, that would not be a good that would not be the best use of my strengths, perhaps. Um, anyways, I would say start there. And then when you go with a team, I don't think you don't have to go cold turkey necessarily. Maybe give yourself five minutes and just pick one of the stations that you liked, that you felt intuitive, like you could create some things. Let's say you really like the crawls. And like, yeah, I, I've, I found out these interesting crawls that felt cool. All right, take five minutes for your athletes and just have them do like some crawling, some crab walks, some lateral crawls, some rolls, and maybe find those places say, Hey, yeah, every time I say this, you have to do some push-ups." or every time I, you know, you could do a whistle. I don't like whistles. Cause to me, that's too much of a rigid like mentality, but every time, you know, maybe you have to throw a tiger bound in the crawls when I say, or another thing we did recently too, that's fun. Find different ways to um, get teammates involved. Like one crawl variation we did was I gave uh, dowel rods are amazing. Uh, I would also recommend experimenting with dowel rods is I would have one uh, partner hold a dowel rod and the person crawling had to jump over it or go under it. You know, they had to decide and they could put it at different heights. And so uh, a lot of it too, is just watching you, you, it's not all on you. You get to just throw some implements in there and watch the, if you have athletes in pairs, watch them have fun, just say mirror. So you could start with mirroring, just say, all right, I'm going to pick hops mirror the person, watch what they do, observe, you know, watch the crawls, mirror in the crawl, watch what they do, see how it's interesting for them. So yeah, I would just say that do it yourself, find the different archetypes. And, and the last the fail safe as I did this at Cal is I would give athletes two options for the warm up sometimes if I wasn't leading it necessarily, or maybe if I had another team and like there's a group of five coming in, I would say all right, option A is here's monkey bars. Here's a 25 pound kettlebell. Here's the ground do whatever you want with those for five, for 10 minutes. <laughs> and like, seriously, like you've done, we've gone through all this stuff before. Here's three things, go play around for 10 minutes and then come back when you're ready to train. Option B is I'm going to write down all the stuff you can do for the warm up. It's not no surprise that most athletes picked option A. They just wanted to play and explore. Uh, I did have some athletes who wanted a structured type, but not often. It was usually just one guy. <laughs> so that's another thing you could do too, is just say, all right, Here's, you know, I mean, again, if you're actually actively coaching, that's a little bit different, but yeah, I would start with those types of principles, pick one thing you feel real comfortable improvising on, start with just that one thing for a few minutes, and then you can, you can build it out as you go, feel more comfortable. So many great points. And I, I asked about that because James and I have been running sessions together for three, four years or so, and let's say over at least a hundred uh, at least 100 speed sessions with, with small groups and, and big group team trainings up to like 150 athletes. And I've never seen him do the same speed training twice. And it's always so fascinating to me, but I've gotten much better at that from working through him. And so everything you're saying is, is like, you know, exactly what I'm feeling as we work together. But we had an intern come up to the, to us the other day after we did 
a 60 minute session where nothing was written out. Nothing was even thought about. And right before the session, he said, what are you guys about to do with these guys? <laughs> and we look at him and say, well, we'll find out in the next two minutes, right? Like we'll, we'll figure it out. Great session. And we finish. And then the coach comes up and he says, I am so deep into these books that I can't even imagine running a session the way you guys do it. One of the, because he's the opposite, right? He, he, he wants the percentages. He wants the analytics and he doesn't have any idea how he could ever get into that more flow state, less structure type training. And then we talk and I can't imagine ever going the other way, ever going to where we are actually tracking things. Um, you know, coaches ask and, and, and parents ask KPIs and things like that all the time. And we always say, well, kind of, how much fun is your athlete having? What are they, yeah. what are the conversations when they leave and they get in the car and they drive home? Do they want to come back? Is, is it things that they enjoy? Well, if it is, that's, that's great because then, then we're making some progress. Um, so it was just so interesting to wonder kind of, okay, where do we start from that? Cause we're so far into it the other way that I think it's interesting to, to know kind of where you started. Um, I guess the other point to that is with the athletes you're working with, sometimes it's hard to get them to buy into the creativity because they have grown up on the whistle, on the cone, a skips, knees up, toe in front. I mean, tall, rigid chest. They, they've heard that for 10, 15 years by the time they get to us. What are some of the conversations that we can have with the athletes to help them understand that there are great benefits to this style of, of coaching and this style of training? Yeah, I think that's a good one. I, I think that one thing and I've heard multiple coaches say this is if the athlete is you know interested in this is show them, you could show them video of them actually playing. Like if you can't, like if you have actual game footage of them and be like, all right, well, Hey, see how you actually sprinted here when you were playing versus like the a skips or see how you change direction there versus when someone wanted you to run around a cone, look how different that is. And one of the, the cool things Michael Zwiefel said this is the, the perception in the environment will dictate the technique. Um, and, and I guess that's one way that you could communicate it. I've actually never, I, I think that I've never really had an issue with athletes. I, for me, if an athlete is like, I mean, I've given athletes a menu, like the athlete at Cal who wanted the rigid warm up, I gave him the rigid warm up, but I wasn't his swim <laughs> coach either. Right. Like, and it's funny because I, so the women's side of things, they, they coached very like fluidly, like not like rigid and, and the rigid coaching too. It's funny. Like I saw, um, you occasionally see this, like the strength coach or the speed coach who their profile picture on social media is them like kneeling, like right next to the start line. So they're like right down there to like check the first step and check the shin angle. And they live off that. They're like, Oh, hit, you know, hammer back at 45 degrees or whatever. Like they're going to say the same thing to probably like every athlete. And then, but then, then you could actually show the athlete. And this is how I kind of try to address a lot of what I do on like social media or YouTube is like, well, no, let's, uh, let's show you a video of an elite athlete. And let's show you how they actually move, you know, and like, and let's show you how they're all different too. Like, they're not all the same. We're not all robots. Let me show you how this athlete moves differently than this athlete. And so I, I will say that some athletes who are like that athlete at Cal, who always picked the, the regimented warm up, he, that made him feel safe. Like he, and, and, and that's the thing is athletes do to a level need to feel at least like a level of comfort and safe. Like, again, there is times to break out of that for sure. But like, if I'm tired, and this was swimming too, like if this guy played basketball or football, totally different story. No, you better be comfortable with chaos. Like he probably was in swim, and this guy was explosive too. He had a 41 inch vertical, was the second place NCAA 50 meter swimmer. Like, but if he played volleyball, or, you know, it's probably too much chaos for him. Like he wants to, that's part of the reason he probably wanted regimented because he's comfortable with that. If we're teaching sports, you have to be okay with being in an open, chaotic environment. And so I, you know, I don't, I actually haven't had that many athletes who are like, oh man, I really like, you don't want me to, you I, my, one of the first things I usually do with any athlete is I'll say, let me see you do some skips. Like usually like an older athlete, not younger, but like someone who's been through coaching, go do skips. I don't tell them how to do it. I just watch them skip. And almost always the, the hyper coach ones, it's like, eh. you know, they're, they're trying to hit positions. They're trying to lift their knees up because someone told them that's how you skip. And I, I just think it's funny because I have kids. I watch kids skip and gallop and all these things. And or go watch Usain Bolt warm up. And if you have show notes, like that's a, such a cool thing to watch. Like that guy doesn't look like like when I was coaching track. I'll t I'll take take this back. And like I tell stories, I guess. And this is just this is my way of solving this problem. Is I I think my wife tells me that I'm relatively convincing. 
Um, so maybe that's just a gift of mine and how I'll tell athletes these stories are like, like watch your same bolt, bolt warm up or like when I was coaching track at Wilmington, I had athletes who were super sprint drill all-stars. They wanted to do everything very regimented. They're like, oh, oh, hitting all the positions and we're going to tra- take sprint drills seriously. And, and the guys who actually were the laziest in the sprint drills, like, I'm not kidding. The guys who were the laziest of the sprint drills were the fastest athletes. And I think it's because their brain knew that this is not sprinting. This is not, this is someone's manufactured, ver- you know, dance version. And again, dancing rhythm is good, by the way. I actually think that that's one of the best things of sprint drills. If you can teach them the right rhythm, a lot of people do it too rigidly. Like I want people to have some swagger if they're doing that kind of stuff, you know? Um, and the guys who did have more swagger in those drills, more natural rhythm, were the fastest ones. And watch Usain Bolt warm up. He isn't doing like these like hyper regimented tense A skips. And tense is a big one too. You know a tense sprint drill and, and like a relaxed natural. There is a big difference between those two. And so just show people who are saying bolt warming up, be like, yeah, this guy's the world record holder in the hundred. Look how he warms up, you know? And so I think that a storytelling can be one showing like elite athletes, uh, the soccer player who just passed away, Miradana, watch that guy warm up. You know, he's playing, he's having fun. Like, don't you want to be like that guy? Or do you want to be like the, you know, the person who has to, so, I mean, just show people elite athletes, show them the stories, show Steph Curry warming up. You know, like show athletes having fun and exploring and, and be like, all right, do you want to be like this person? Or do you want to be, you know, and so I, usually I think I'm convincing enough that I'll have an athlete do a skip and be like, man, who taught you how to dance? You know, like, I'll just, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So I, that's kind of my style, but I, I'm, I, sorry, I don't have a great answer for that one. And, and I, th- I think we still have coaches out there that would see Usain Bolt warm up and say like, oh man, if only he did a 15 minute dynamic warm up with a mini band, he'd be running this time. <laughs> Uh, in, in, in claiming that, but, um, that's so true. That's so it's, it's just like, you have to be yourself. You have to do, you know, you have to kind of feel, um, feel that rhythm and, and that flow in those, you know, that, that, um, there's just that certain, like, there's that it factor that some athletes have. Um, and, and, and you can see it, like you said, in the sprint warmups is like, you can watch that warm up and kind of see like these guys kind of understand how to flow with their body. They have that it factor. It's the same in like field sports, um, you know, baseball players like pitchers have that it factor of that attitude. And, and we'll see the same thing a lot with baseball players where they'll have like a very structured 45 minute to, to an hour throwing routine before they throw their 20 pitch bullpen. And I always ask them, yeah, but when you're in the bullpen, can you do any of that? And they're like, no. And I was like, well, why, why are we doing that now? Um, and there seems to be that disconnect, um, you know, in, and how we relay that. And, and I think the, like you said, like I've been able to listen to your podcast, so, you know, over and over as soon as it comes out, because you are easy to listen to. Um, you are very kind of convincing and you do such a good job of bringing valid points um, from the, the science realm, the research realm, but also like the intuition realm. Um, and I think you do such a unique job of bringing those two worlds together. Um, you know, what are some of those things that, that you have, have learned over the last 10 years that you would be able to tell yourself at 25, like, Hey, let me save you some time. If you, if you start looking at these things now, you'll have a lot better outcomes sooner. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think one of the things would have been to watch more athletes on video. Um, I think because I didn't technique was too complex for me to understand back when I was younger. And to be completely honest, it wasn't until I met a Darian bar that I think I even, really could get it I, I i always would hear people like track coaches giving cues and instructions and i always kind of wondered like where did you get that from why did you decide that was a good idea even hearing knees up and sprinting i remember thinking should you get your knees up like no one ever really told me that like i didn't you know like i i've always questioned why people even gave cues in the first place and so part of it is a it, it, I think I would have had a hard time watching video without someone like a Darian to help take me through it. But I do remember the very first time I even watched, um, like when I was coaching track, I did have some success and from the structural level. And we talk about, I will say too, I just did want to touch on this is there's, there's like these two archetypes, like totally structured, total free for all. Like, and we all know the coach who doesn't know what they're doing and, and, and like just is totally lost, right? Like we don't want to be that. Um, we do want to have enough structure we want to have the frame of the house <laughs> uh like i was just reading a, a like a, a section of the Tao Te Ching this morning and it was talking about 
Like it's the emptiness that creates the potential for movement. Like you don't want to make this pot and then just fill it up with a bunch of crap before you can pour water in it. Like you have to have enough pot <laughs> to carry the thing that you're going to put in it. There has to be enough pot there. Um, so I, I do think that's helpful. And that's what I had. Like when I was in my twenties, I had structure. I read all the books and I knew all the training programs and I was able to create a structure to, um, I, I worked with an athlete who ran the number three all time uh, NCAA D3 time in the 55 meter dash. I got her insanely explosive, but in looking back, I knew if I just knew some of the stuff I knew about technique now and, and how to coach it. Cause I didn't even try to coach her technique for the most part. Cause I knew it wasn't going to change anything. Um, but I think if I would have watched, and I remember when I finally did video her, like towards the very end, I was like, man, something's really wrong about this running technique. Like I just didn't, I, I literally just didn't appreciate movement at all. And I wish I would have just spent more time observing slow motion video, even if I didn't know what was going on or watching animals, watching how animals moved and really trying to pay attention. I had no clue till I met a Darian. And then, and nowadays I just, I spend a lot of time watching video. I, I like watching, you know, animals in nature and how they move, not to the level that a Darian can watch them. A Darian, Oh, Darren Barr, by the way, a huge mentor of mine in movement. He has watched a bird take off for three hours on video, <laughs> slow motion. Like that's how I knew it. He is. Um, most of us will never touch that. One of my uh, swim motor learning mentors, uh, Milton Elms, he grew up on a farm and watched animals. Like these, the people who know motor learning, who know it really good, almost always they've watched animals move and they're really into it. And so like, that's the person I would listen to more than the person who gets all their movement data out of a lab, which is probably where I, like even early, like, Someone said the lab said, oh yeah, vertical force and sprinting is king. And so I just believed it because oh, it comes out of a lab. And then when I'm writing speed strength, I'm like going into that study. I'm like, wait a second. That study is so biased because that's how the force plate sits. When you look at all these other studies, it actually shows horizontal force is the big one that changes when you go from um, like jogging to full sprint. So we always research, just take it with a grain of salt and look at everything. You know, it's a tool just like everything else is. And so I just think that I would have gotten more of my learning from observing slow motion video and actually really taking time to get into it and look at it with an open mind and then watching nature. Uh, the other one would have been probably to, yeah, to try to get, well, even when I was at Wilmington, we played games to warm up. Like I didn't even, I wasn't even trying to do all the crawls. I would say, here's the Frisbee. Let's play games for, let's play Frisbee for 20 minutes before we do our sprint workout. That works pretty good. Um, uh, the other point of advice would have been to ask more questions just of everybody, all the other assistant coaches. Hey, why, you know, what, where, what's your background? What were the workouts you did when you were, you know, you felt were helpful for you just to understand why the coaches then did what they did. And I, I, cause since I've done my podcast, I've gotten better at asking questions and it's a really important part of who I've become. I didn't ask those questions in my twenties. Um, I just read books. I was always like, I'm going to learn it myself person. I'm going to read all these books and learn it myself. And, I've gotten to be a better question asker. I think if we all, you know, like that's why podcasts are so awesome. Um, asking questions more. So that's what I would have told myself at 25. Those are all awesome points, Joel. I know you have, speaking of podcasts, you have in here shortly have another one to record. Um, I, I would like to get into some kind of, uh, not so much rapid fire, but more like questions without a ton of continuity. Um, just to get some of your thoughts on it that we've seen from different different posts and listen to some of your podcasts. Um, you talk about how important athlete wins are, which I think is super cool. Um, can you expand on the idea of how important it is, um, you know, for athletes and coaches, for their athletes to have um, athlete wins when they when they come in into the gym? Yeah, 100%. So that's something we're actually like speaking of me, more regimented systems. Uh, Louis Simmons, who sits halfway, his West Side barbell sits halfway between us, uh, legendary powerlifting coach. And, you know, one of the things that's common about West Side, I mean, there those lifters have sent tons of records. And of course, there's way a lot of different records in powerlifting, right? But just super successful powerlifting community. And one of the things you always hear about West Side is, unless you train there, you're not really training at West Side, which speaks to it's not just a program. And uh, one of my training partners, um, I had the opportunity to work out with a lot actually spent time at west side working with louis and one of the things that he learned from louis is louis would say try to find a chance for an athlete to always win the workout which would mean like let's say i walk in and i have the constraint of my, you know my nervous system just isn't outputting very much today you know the maximal weight i can lift the coach already knows it it's not going to be a pr 
but you have to walk out with feeling like like every session is like a mini hero's journey you know there needs to be some the hero's journey there's a challenge and then i come back there needs to be some challenge in the session that i feel like i can overcome because if there isn't well i'm just kind of you know punching the clock and i will say that some of the punch the clock stuff that i it depends on what you're punching the clock on too. I will say the rudimentary stuff, you can punch the clock, which is if you're an athlete that isn't a strength athlete, you can punch the clock on the lifts. Like that's, I actually, I, for me where I'm at now, like I do easy strength for my personal lifting component. And I just, I just go through the movements. Like I don't, I don't get it all amped up. I don't care. I do my front squats. I do my cleans. I do my pull-ups. I do my push-ups. That takes me like 15 minutes. It's not, I do my heavy loaded carries to get a little more supination. I I do that and I don't care. The stuff to win is the stuff that's the big deal. So if I'm a sprinter, how did I win the sprint workout? If I'm a basketball athlete, how did I win something that's related to basketball? Um, Like maybe that's if I'm in the realm of the gym, a sport is more like playing soccer is honestly more related to basketball than lifting weights is. <laughs> so, I mean, and honestly, just winning at having fun playing soccer to me is a win in that perspective. But let's just say I'm, I'm let's just say it's track because I think speed, everyone loves speed. So, you know, like, let's say it's a sprint workout. And how do I um, create grounds for that athlete to win that workout? And So let's say, well, one is I want to make sure I put that workout on the day where I feel like the athlete has the absolute best chance of setting a PR because that's just knowing that you're improving is a big deal. But let's just say we walk in and the athletes, I know, oh man, we're doing 10 meter fly sprints today and they should be really fast, but I know they're not. Okay. Now I have to find a way to modulate this workout so they can still be like, oh, I had a challenge and I still PR like the bigger, faster, stronger mentality. And I think that mentality is beautiful, but let's just apply it to the higher transfer thing in the totem pole, if that makes sense. I don't mind punching the clock with the lifts, like one by 20, one by 10, easy strength, whatever, punch the clock. To me, not a huge deal. And uh, let's, let's win at the stuff that's closer to what your sport is. Um, so, well, anyway, so with sprinting, maybe I change it to, all right, well, I'm going to put down paint sticks or like four inch mini hurdles. And you're going to, and I'm actually going to set them up randomly. Like they aren't like seven feet, seven feet, seven feet. Maybe it's six feet, eight feet, four feet, you know, like it's just this weird thing. And you have to run that 10 meter fly over this new course that I've created. So you've never experienced this before. It's a totally new problem. And, you know, let's just see how fast you can go on it. Like, and you're going to improve every one. So now the athlete at least has improvement. They're doing the same kind of thing, but on the day, they at least got better. Whereas if I said, all right, we're just going to do the 10 meter fly, you might come in and maybe your first one's the fastest. And now you're straining to hopefully you PR and you don't. So you didn't, you didn't have that win in your mind and your brain didn't, you didn't, your body didn't learn anything. It didn't learn how to get faster because you actually ran slower. (laughs) So you might as well get faster doing something new. Uh, So, and you could change things. You could do like a slight uphill. I wouldn't do a slight downhill if you're, you know, kind of beat up. Uh, we could try a one arm, you know, maybe you let's do a one arm, you know, we haven't done a one arm run in a while. Let's do a one arm, 10 meter fly PR. See if you can do that, you know, or I don't know, carry a medicine ball and try to set a PR. Let's see if we can do that. Maybe let's make it uh, longer. Let's see if you can do, um, you know, you could say, let's, all right, forget the 10 fly. And we're going to do like a 200 meter squatty run or something. And I don't know, like, or, or I could make it variable and I could say, we're going to do a 150. And every time I you could have a whistle just could be the easiest there. Every time I blow the whistle, you got to go from running to a squatty run. And then when I blow it again, you can go regular, you know, like now their intention is in what they're doing. It's not on the time. It's taking their mind off that, that PR that they're probably not going to get today, but at least we're having fun doing this, bringing the intention into the now. Uh, usually the higher reps is stuff you can PR, but yeah, I would just change the thing. So it's something maybe we haven't done in a while that I think you can PR in this compared to the last time. So yeah, just always being mindful of that. And then however Louis Simmons does in powerlifting, I imagine he has probably a similar mentality. Let's use a lift variation you haven't done in a while. And let's just try to get a PR on that today. So finding creative ways to allow for personal bests or just make it experiential. You could also do speedgate golf too. Sorry, this is writing around. I'm going forever. Speedgate <laughs> golf would be, right. hey, oh, good. <laughs> how, how close can you get to this, like to running a one Like whoever gets closest to one today wins the end. <laughs> It's also maximal. It's not, now the objective is not max, it's precision. And that's a totally different, you know, version of it. We still had fun. We still 
got something out of it. How precise could you run 120? Uh, so yeah, those are some different ways you could change up that that main script. Those are so good. You do bring up a great point. If you bring athletes in, let's say we test them every Tuesday on a flying 10, one Tuesday, they run a 101. The next Tuesday, they run a 102. They're always so upset about it. And it's, I mean, it's not even, I can't even snap that fast. Right. And James and I've talked yeah. about, well, what if your left leg crosses the beam first instead of your right leg? Like that's enough time, you know, all these things, but it totally throws athletes off. And then that might change the course of the rest of their day. You know, worst case scenario, they have a horrible day because they ran a, a did they even run that hundredth of a second? So I don't, I don't yeah, know. If, it's, so if all... it's a particular timing system, they might not have, I won't say which one, but one of my timing systems is off by 0.3 about either way. So, <laughs> so you, got, you got some guys flying, you yeah. got some athletes flying, got some, got some slower, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Here's the other one. You, you have already mentioned a, a, a good amount of mentors and, and I know you've got plenty more and anybody who just listens to your just fly podcast get, gets a crazy amount of information from these conversations. Um, so I want to know being somebody who's always taking in so much information, reading all the books, been training for a long time, been doing your own thing physically, been coaching for a long time. What excites you about training and about the, the field of strength and conditioning? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, one of the things that I went to last year, I've had Rafe Kelly on my podcast twice, um, big human movement play, like the, the origin of movement. Why do we move? Why do we play sports? I went to his return to the source. Um, it was a week long retreat just in nature. Like, and I'll tell you, what, it's crazy. Like we live in this world of just hyper information, hyper, you know, I mentioned like the clay pot or the Tao Te Ching. We live in the world where that pot is constantly just, you know, it's <laughs> overflowing. It's overflowing with cues. It's overflowing with sports seasons. It's just nice to get back to nature where those, those like where club sports and even pro sports doesn't exist. And it's just about you being a human with a community and playing. And we are so far from that. It is just crazy. And so much of why I think I was taken back into the strength and conditioning community after like being, I just want to coach track. I want to be D1 track coach. You know, I'm, it's all competition. And can I, can I be the best jumps coach? Well, it's like, there is a lot more people out there. I mean, 70% of athletes quit sport at age 13. And then the rest of their life is, oh, fitness is going and being on a treadmill for an hour or trading calories for whatever. Or it's just some like, like comment about, oh yeah, jacked and tan and then, you know, doing all the, you know, some, something about like just being super buff. But it's like, but we don't instill that just like, look, movement is life. Movement is fun. I have young kids. They move all day. Uh, when I play, when I have the, my five-year-old soccer team play freeze tag, they're laughing and screaming and just like, and we lose all that. I tell you, like, seriously, it becomes, you know, judgment and coaches. And did you win? Did you lose? Did you improve? Even as much as I freaking love speed, did you get, get faster in that fly? Right. Like, and I, and I love that. I mean, I, I love that stuff. I work with masters track athletes now, and I absolutely love programming for them, helping them to be their absolute best. But I love just the joy of movement and just playing games. Like when it, there was one game we played at Rafe's return of the source uh, retreat, and it was at the beach and we all had to go get logs and, and, you know, work together to carry them to this area. We made like a square of these logs and just played this game where you had to like, as a team run to the other side of the log and push the other team off and you could hop on rocks along the way. And we changed the rules a little bit while we did it. And that was so much fun. I mean, we, we've gone so far from that in sport, in movement. Like I see it even in fitness, it's very much taken over by, you know, high intensity training. It's going to get you jacked and tan. You're going to work out with, work out with co-eds and it's going to be like this, like kind of like, I don't know, you were talking about like the, the bang energy drink stand, right? Like that's what we think about when we think about <laughs> fitness is just this co-ed jacked and tan thing. Like it's, a, it's so much, sure, maybe that could be a part of it, but it's so much more than that. It's about just fun and play. And being that that part of you that's a kid that loved playing freeze tag, if you don't have that with you anymore at some point in your movement experience, that I just think it's we've lost something. And it's also reflective of, I think, a greater um, need in society. Um, definitely, if you look into Rafe's work with John Berveke and, and purpose and meaning, like we don't move and we don't enjoy movement. And and 
that's everything. It, it actually transcends all the PRs. It transcends everything else we're doing. I mean, again, I love PRs. <laughs> I, I still sprint and I still try to figure out how to sprint faster and jump faster on a weekly basis, but you can't ever get too far from who we are, from games, from fun, from joy. I, and that's everything. So that's, that's it, man. That's been the big mentorship is digging into Rafe's work and meaning. It's so awesome. We, um, we always wrap up Joel with the question, what do you think we're missing in the industry? And it almost sounds stupid to ask it now because <laughs> that, that answered the question. Um, so thank you for all that. That was excellent. Um, if people want more of your info, if people are, I mean, salivating in the mouth after listening to this, to this podcast, where can they find Joel Smith on, on social media, online, out of your facility? Um, tell us all about that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, you go to um, yeah, just fly sports on Twitter, Instagram, and then my podcast is just fly performance podcast, which I'm trying to you know, have guests. Of, actually, uh, this Thursday, I'm recording a really cool get, um, podcast on based kind of this topic. So you can hear more there. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'm out at Cincinnati, Ohio. So if you want to play some games, have fun or sprint faster, or whatever, you know, stop on by the gym. I, I work out of Evo fit in Mainville, Ohio. So Cincinnati outskirts. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. We, uh, we got to figure out James and I a summer trip to be able to get, get around and, and talk to all the guys we've had on. I mean, Cincinnati is not a, not a bad trip from us being out here in Cleveland. So coach, thanks so much for being on. This was so much, so much info. Um, got multiple, multiple notes pages here. And I think this is great for everybody in the industry and everybody even out of the industry who's, who has kids in, you know, who are playing sports and should recognize, well, maybe I need to see if my, my kids coaches, is thinking about this and doing these same things. Um, so for everybody who's made it this far, thank you for listening. Episode 38 with Joel Smith this has been the cutoffs and coffee podcast. We ask you three things before we head out. Number one, please continue to practice gratitude. Number two, tell the people that you love, that you love them. And number three, live your life stimulated. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll catch you on next time.